Divine Truth Interviews. Jesus, Mary and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. This is the first part of the interview, Identity and Self-Belief, where Jesus and Mary are visited and interviewed by Vice Journalist and Editor Julian Morgans about their identity and self-belief. But brief discussions of topics such as honesty, emotions, courage, life, self-knowledge, self-confidence and death are also included. The interview was recorded on 22nd of September 2017 from 1.10 p.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Do you, do you not like being on camera, Julian? No, I, I don't mind it, actually. I, um, I was telling Jesus you wanted before. to be a director. I, uh, I went to film school. Yeah. So I, I came from, I never studied journalism. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not really, I'm not a real journalist. I'm a fake journalist. But I, um, I came from film school. I, I got into writing and got into Vice that way. And uh, now here I am. Yeah. So are you like a staffer for Vice or are you like a freelance person? For no, I, I, so most of the time I'm, I'm the editorial, I'm head of editorial. So I started as a, as a staff writer and I uh-huh. sort of became a, I don't know, middle management guy. Yeah. Uh, you got a pen for the, for the writing. Obviously, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, they wouldn't make you. I, yeah, I, I think I think I was lucky in that sense. Right, writing came quite naturally to me, which was a really great discovery because I wasn't great at film. Um, and then, yeah, and now most of the time I'm just sort of managing the editorial department, so mm-hmm. just delegating stories. So yeah, it's full time. It's yeah. Uh, I don't get to do stories very much. I just do the stories that I really care about. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, which I think is a better way to do it. Yeah, that's a nice, nice thing to know. A uh, nice opportunity, hey, to choose what you want. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. Um, we didn't have TV, <laughs> but I understand now SBS no longer exists. And Vi- I'm asking this question. Oh, did you? <laughs> I'll ask you later. <laughs> they did, Eliza. No, no, no. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's SBS, the same SBS box. exists. Is it it's the, the same, same box. box. <laughs> SBS exists. Yeah. All that happened is that SBS 2, I think, because SBS has like two or three different channels. digital yeah. channels. Mm-hmm. So SBS 2 was their kind of uh, alternative uh, younger youth Document. audience uh-huh. kind of documentary uh-huh. one. Yep. And so they were thinking, uh, my understanding was it wasn't as it existed, it wasn't working well for them. Mm-hmm. So they approached us and said, hey, we want to, because Viceland was already in the US and in the mm-hmm. UK and across Europe. So they said, hey. And that is a channel that is. Yeah, it's a, a yeah, proper channel. It is, yeah. it is the yeah. thing. And it's part of Vice. Like, I just Vice. know Vice as like online journalism pretty much. Yeah. Before we now. did a lot of YouTube videos and that sort of yes. stuff. That's kind of That's how we got famous. Saying. Yes. Uh, and then, and then from that, we got a lot of funding, you know, in New York, which is where they're based. They got a lot of funding from various, I know, Viacom and a couple of big corporations through its money. We expanded, created Viceland, mm-hmm. um, and now, well, yeah, for us, it's a simple case of we just brought all of the content that was being made in Europe, the US. We brought it to Australia and we licensed it out to SBS two, gotcha. um, and then they rebadged themselves as, as Viceland, SBS Viceland. Yep. So it's it's a collaboration, really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we, we still run, on SBS Viceland, still runs a lot of original SBS shows. So, like, they were doing a show called The Feed. Yep. So that still runs amongst all of our other Viceland stuff. Gotcha. Um, so we're actually in the process at the moment of trying to make a few local series, a couple of local shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, you know, it's a slow process, but we're getting there. Yeah. Mm. And what do you, do you, what do you, sorry, I know you're supposed to be asking us a question. No, no, last no, question. It's, it's fine, go for it. <laughs> what do you think about um, Vice as like the ethos of Vice itself, like how it approaches journalism or what it, what its philosophy is? Like I can, uh, how do you feel about it or what do you, I, I have well, kind of impression. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. sure. Well, I came to Vice because... I, I just loved their documentaries. For me, it was like 10 minutes of just, wow, that's crazy. Well, that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. And I loved the way that they wouldn't, there wasn't that kind of Channel 7 sort of a current affair feeling of we go there wearing suits and, you know, yep. it's just people who go to places where there is that, that is a, I don't know, a party in on a Ukrainian island or if that is like a war zone or yes. if that is a you know yeah. a, a yes. village in Colombia, whatever it is, you just send a regular person there. Yeah. And then you see it through their unbiased oh, eyes. Yeah. So so I liked it in the sense it was just raw and very honest and made clearly on a budget and it was just 
just like, hey, this is what it looks like. You mm -hmm. want to go there, this is what you'll see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I like, you just strip away the kind of the, the rubbish. Mm -hmm. And I like that feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, so that for me, that's, that is the heart of it. Mm -hmm. It's just, we, we take you there. That's, mm -hmm. that's the idea. We want to mm -hmm. just take the viewer there mm -hmm. and not, not try to decorate it with some sort of news angle. Yep. Um, and, you know, sometimes I think we're true to that to varying degrees. You know, sometimes we release things and I'm like, no, that's not that great. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think when we do it, I think it's the best. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, that's, I'm proud of that. That was yep. good. That was yeah. vice. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so that's the idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. got to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 No, I, I used to sort of have, have that, that used to have that appeal to me as well. And then I don't know, I just saw a couple of things and I felt like there was a bit of a try hard feel to, to be kind of hip and cool about the whole thing. And like, we are just regular Joes, but as soon as you yeah. get hip and cool about that, then to me, that's yucky. Yeah, like it's yeah, just yeah. another thing. Like Channel totally. 7's got their thing. That's the We've thing got that's our version thing. of that thing. Yes. No, no, I think, yeah. I think that's a hundred percent valid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, Vice was always trying to be cool. Uh, it started as skate magazine, essentially. Right, yeah. It started in Montreal in the 90s, and the idea was that it was just, uh, we're offensive, basically. We just wanted to <laughs> do stuff that was just, we covered stories that were just like, I think one of the first documentaries I ever saw from Vice was about uh, a part a part of, I can't remember, it was like Central America where it was socially acceptable to have sex with donkeys. And, and you know, it was just like, what the hell? Why did yeah. they make this? Yeah. 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 Uh, so there was always that kind of like, let's shock people yeah. thing. But then but then it kind of just evolved in into this mm, more comfortable spot where a lot of people who wouldn't have watched the, the donkey sex episode <laughs> would watch <laughs> other episodes. Yes. And then, but that. then it was still trying to cater for both audiences a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's where yeah. you've had that experience yeah. of being like, man, I, I like this, but yeah. I'm not sure about this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think we're still kind of, certainly the TV thing is, is not softened it, but it's, it's made it a bit more accessible for a larger audience, mm -hmm. which personally for me, I'm, I'm not sure about sometimes, but yeah, yeah. I, look, I think, I think that Vice at its best is still really good. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I absolutely agree that sometimes it can be a little annoying. Yeah. Well, I'm not really exposed to it anymore. Anything, well, we don't, we don't no. like Mary said, we don't watch Tony much. And, no. Yeah. I'm just trying to let them see my face in the main camera there. Oh, I notice okay. And notice that they can't. Okay. <laughs> but anyway. Well, what if I move this way? Is that, is that no, no, no. Because, no, no. Is that, how are you? How are you? Oh, it's good. Okay. Yeah, it's good. That all looks all pretty good to me. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to take one more photo because I just really like the <clears throat> what we're doing here. Uh, and then I have to say we just do this. I'm going to get my knee. I'm going to help. Like. <laughs> Great. Let's. Um, I'm going to record this on my phone. Sure, I'll get with you guys. We, you will have an audio as a part of the video as well. So. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, it just makes it easier. <clears throat> If I just know, I've got a copy right here and I don't have to, um, I don't know, just yeah. go up the floor this way. It's just the familiar way to do it. Uh, all right, so look, I was, I was telling Jesus before that I want to just keep this really, just quite casual. I like just how we were talking out there on the deck before. Yeah, yeah just keep doing that. That was nice. And um, uh, I think just with the first questions, I'm just going to approach the first questions as though I just have no idea who you guys are mm -hmm. and what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and I think that just sort of strips away any any kind of preconceptions or blah, blah, blah. It just lets you guys speak for yourselves. Yeah. Um, and then after we've got down the sort of, you know, who you are, where we are, all that stuff, then I want to go into the kind of wires and the more philosophical mm -hmm. philosophical stuff. And I think thematically I want to talk about, um, about self-belief because as we were discussing before, mm -hmm. you know, where do you, for, I guess for both of you, mm -hmm. how do you how do you just decide that one day you're going to, to announce to the world that you have big answers and your source is is kind of divine, uh, that's that's going to be difficult. Mm. I would find that hard. So I'm I'm genuinely curious. Mm -hmm. Where does that strength come from? You know, you ever embarrassed questions like that? Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know. First question. You did you how many points? You no, know, I was just going to say if that's that question, good questions. They're good questions. <laughs> yeah, I'd let you answer first and then I'd answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my first, my, look, my first question, uh, maybe we'll just say this one at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is, who are you? Who am I? Yeah. And, well, 
I was born in this life. Uh, my name is Alan John Miller. Um, that's that what my parents named me anyway. <laughs> but uh, but like I know who I am um, based upon my memories, basically. So I know that I'm Jesus from the first century, but not only from the first century, I've lived 2,000 years, not just a life in the first century and then now. So basically I have just a bit over 2,000 years of memories about my life. So so I can say quite categorically, at least with, for myself, that that's who I am. Yeah. Okay. And just to be clear, Jesus as in Jesus of Nazareth. Well, I suppose that's what people call me now, but you know, I was Yeshua ben Joseph. My my father was my father was Joseph of Nazareth, Nazareth but my mother she was born elsewhere, of course. But the back then, they didn't trace the mothers very much. They weren't that interested in the in the uh, where, where mothers came from generally. But yeah, that's that's the name that the Bible has given me. But um, but the distinction is that not. Not everything that's written in the Bible is true about our lives. So, so, yeah. so when people say, "Oh, Jesus of Nazareth," well, um, yes, but no, not in the way that Christians view that to be yeah. God. And and the reality is, I lived in Nazareth from the time I was thirteen years of age to the time I was nineteen years of age. So I lived there for six years, <laughs> and uh, you know the reality is I could have just as easily be called Jesus from Egypt because I lived there from the first thirteen years of my life, or Jesus from Bethlehem because I was born there, or Jesus from Capernaum because that's where I lived a fair portion of my life before I met Mary and started travelling a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know it just you know it, it just is a name given to me to identify me, I suppose. But the reality is I lived in a lot of places in the first century, not just in Nazareth. Yeah, sure, mm-hmm. sure. And uh, and how would you describe yourself these days? What's what's the role that you have here? Um, I don't know if I feel I have a role. Um, I have memories about my my existence, of course, which everybody does have. Like you would have memories about your own existence. You know who you are. Like so, when somebody says who are you, and you say I'm Julian, they go, well, who's Julian? You 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 you've got your memories to to basically tell you who you are. Yeah, but I guess I'd say, hi, I'm Julian Morgans from Vice. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how you, how you, you identify from the Vice part? <laughs> yeah, I get that. And I, no, the way I see it is, I'm just an individual, just the same as any other person is an individual on the planet. I'm just a person and a, a, a guy, a male person in this case, uh, of which I'm half a soul. The other half of the soul is my girl, Mary, here, mm-hmm. and um. And in terms of my desires and my passions, well, my desire has always been relationship with God, finding out the truth about God, and then try and finding out the truth about the universe I live in. And that's always been my passion uh, ever since I can remember in the first century right the way through my existence. And so that's what I'm focused on doing all the time. And then once I've found the truth about something that I know for sure is the truth about something, I like to share it because that I feel the most logical and also the most loving thing to do. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mary, how would, how would you describe yourself? Describe me? Mm. Uh, well, I would describe myself as, well, conveniently my parents uh, 38 years ago named me Mary. Uh, so uh, I was called Mary, Mary Suzanne Luck. Um, but I have memories and I'm actually Mary Magdalene. <laughs> um I, yeah, and I definitely feel the other half of this guy as well. <laughs> and I've got, similarly, I have memories um, of that that very long existence of which sometimes this last 38 years seems very sort of minor or insignificant when I start to experience myself and experience my emotions. Um yeah, and I equally feel that my priorities are really to to be and express myself in the world, and a big part of that is um, sharing my passion for God and also my passion for the welfare of humankind and how humans live on the planet. That's always mm. been a massive um, part of what's important to me and to try and assist people in whatever way that I can um, to have happy, healthy fulfilled lives in ways that don't damage themselves or other people. Yeah. You're a carer. 
<laughs> nurturer. <laughs> no, if I'm a nurturer, I'd like to be a nurturer, but I, I'm very passionate about issues relating to um, to love and to truth, and mm. about s- lasting solutions to problems. Yeah, mm. I feel, mm. feel quite concerned about suffering, and but not very interested in altering that in a quick fix kind of a way. You know, and much to my um, kind of sometimes I get frustrated with myself and I know that I did in my professional life with how much it wasn't good enough for me, just a short-term solution. And I know my bosses both loved and hated it about me because I would always be like, no, you know, there's got to be a way to solve this properly so this doesn't happen or so that it only happens once and it doesn't happen again, whether it's a medical condition or a... an environmental system or a spiritual issue or whatever, I've always had a, a strong connection to finding proper solutions. And I guess it's really this idea, this truth, that there's, there is an ultimate cause to everything. So yeah. there must be, if you can alter the cause, that then there's a permanent lasting solution. But most of the earth has given up on trying to understand what the true causes of things are mm. and just try and deal with the effects of stuff. Mm. to try and make things okay in the short term. It's difficult. Mm. Yeah. It's difficult and complicated. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so collectively, would you guys say that you, you know, you run Divine Truth? You know, how would you, would you describe what you're, you're doing here? Well, I suppose you could say Divine Truth is a, is a, well, the way we see Divine Truth is that Divine Truth means God's truth. And all we're trying to do is discover it and share it. So is Divine Truth a message? You know, is it a website or what, what is it? Well, Divine Truth, we set up a company for, called Divine Truth as well, which actually is the vehicle, the legal vehicle via which we share the things that we know. And we do that using lots of different mechanisms. The website is one of them, but internet, we do seminars, we go and visit places, countries, and talk to pe- groups of people sometimes large groups of people, we visit people's homes and do the same thing. So there's a large variety of activities that we engage in. And the Divine Truth Company, which is just the legal entity that um, we use to pay taxes and all those kind of things, is something that we just set up to allow us to operate, uh, operate it properly um, and, and in, a, in, a, in a legal environment that we currently live in in the world. Mm. Um, What we see as divine truth, though, is different to that. What we see as divine truth is God's truth, God's absolute truth about every matter. And and all we're in the process of doing is discovering it. And then when we discover it and we know it to be true, then we share it. And then sometimes uh, people ask us our personal opinion, and and so under those times we share that too because we're Mm -hmm. honest about our personal opinions, but we also make a clear delineation between our personal opinion and what we know to be God's truth. Mm. Because there's sometimes when we have a personal opinion that we don't really know it to be God's truth at this stage. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. But, yeah, but we do have a website and YouTube channels, uh, which is the main way that we share what we know with other people. Yeah. Um, but we also do, as you mentioned, like public presentations and we're here in the studio where we record a lot that goes on our YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, but also Jesus has like... He probably told you outside a myriad of environmental activities that he's doing everywhere, all over the property, and um, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot about discovering truth in every aspect of life, not just spiritually, but emotionally, physically, how the environment works, how the, what things can fix the world, but also the primary truth, which is about receiving God's love, the human God having a relationship, if you like, and being able to receive God's love and also receive the truth from God. So you don't have to go and discover everything yourself. You can get told the truth and then go through the process of experimenting with what you're being told, whether it's true or not. And uh, there are mechanisms that God's created that all God's children can be told the truth. It's just the problem is that humanity is detuned from those mechanisms Mm. over many, many millennia. And as a result, most people are completely detuned from the ability to discover that kind of truth. Okay. Mm. Okay. So identifying and uh, broadcasting, amplifying truth. That's is that the foundation? 
Yeah, and, and love, of course, because mm. we feel that truth and love are very much codependent on each other. So one can't, one exist can't without the other. really exist without the other. And and we see the world's definition of love as being very different to God's the way God loves. And so we feel that unless the world brings its version of love, if you like, to the way God sees love, then we're going to continue to have the same problems on, in the world that we currently have. From an outside perspective, it seems like you, you've got this message uh, and then you deliver it to a range of people across the world through a range of different ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who are the people? Well, that, that's we don't know pretty most much, of them. <laughs> yeah, we don't know most of them. And pretty much anybody who who is able to to listen or see and at this stage understand English, although we are translating, we have a team of people that translate into other languages as well. Yeah. So um, uh, the, the reality is um, most, as Mary said, most of the people we don't actually know, a lot of them we've never met, but the people we do meet, they are a wide range of people in a wide range of socioeconomic, ra racial and racial distinctions. And age so, groups, really. And age groups. Yeah. So, you know, we've had very old people and also very young people um, as well come to seminars and so forth and who are listening to Divine Truth. In fact, it's probably more young people than old people. Um, um, and certainly not necessarily from any kind of... Some people don't have any spiritual background. They did a Google search and happened upon a clip and mm. and sort of suddenly felt like suddenly uh, felt inspired towards investigating whether God exists or not or reassessing their ideas about God. Mm. Some people come from, you know, various different kind of backgrounds in terms of their religious faith and some have so none. Hindu, Buddhist, um, Muslim, New Age, Christian, Christian sure. and okay. so forth. Yeah. So there's a wide variety. And then there's many people who have been atheists who come yeah. and... But, so, yeah. yeah, but our philosophy is that we want this truth to be available to anyone who wants it, mm. anyone who desires it. So we do a lot, you especially do a lot, to try and create avenues where um, just anyone free of charge can access what we're talking about if they so desire it. So there's, you know, there's ebooks and working on the subtitling project um, as well as videos and the website with a lot of free downloads. People can sync um, the information. Like mm. Yeah. Mm. So. And I mean, I've met a few people today. There's three people in that room right there manning the equipment. Yeah. You know, who yeah. are these people? How do you get these people? Well, these are people that we've met um, over the years of doing what we do. So yeah. I've been doing it now for <clears throat> uh, probably 14 or 13 years, um, since 2004, 13 years. Mm. And during the time between then and now, I've met lots of people, obviously, tens, of, probably hundreds of thousands of people. And occasionally we meet a person who just says, look, I'm so passionate about what you're teaching that I would like to be involved in doing the hard work, which is the behind the scenes type work to get the videos produced and get the sound produced and, and get it out there, you know, get the message out there. And so... Although I still do quite a lot of that work and uh, people have come along like Lena, who's behind our desk at the moment. And I think she has a way of switching the camera to her so you'll be able to see her in the video. Um, and uh, uh, so Lena, you know, we've known for quite a number of years and Lena and her husband decided they wanted to do the video editing. So, so we've worked with them over time and Oops. developed structure to do that. And, and Lena's really stuck to it and she's really enjoying it. So she, she does it. And now uh, people donate to her as well. And we donate to her to, 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 to do that work, her. to support her. Yeah. And so what that means is that she basically now does that. It's not full time, but it's, but it's fairly, you know, it's three, three to four days of the week. Mm. Yeah. And Lena is originally from Melbourne herself. And mm. so she relocates. And things happen sort of gradually over time, like, when I first met Jesus again, he was, nothing was recorded. Um, and then gradually we got but everyone just a would single, have their mobile phones. Yeah, in mobile phone. <laughs> sitting or around. And after a while we floor. thought, mm -hmm. oh, well, perhaps it'd be good if we provided a decent recording. <laughs> and also, uh, you'd have to stop repeating yourself because you, you record it, people can watch a video. And it yeah. started out just as DVDs, just handed around to people. Yes. Yeah. So Lena's husband uh, was a plaster and he worked on a building site and somebody handed him this dvd like 
and said, I, I'm not much into this guy, but you might like it. Really? And, yeah. And so he watched the DVD and then he, he was like, well, what is there more of this? <laughs> and he's actually the one who's, you already had the website, but he actually started the first YouTube channel because wow. he wanted other people to hear about it. Yeah. And so, yeah. and then gradually over time, they decided to relocate to Queensland and they lived on the coast and they helped out with some sound editing and, and then over time, they got more passionate about it and decided, look, no, we want to live closer. And so they moved closer and, and gradually these things kind of yeah. evolve, you know. Yeah. And that's yeah. the case for everybody who who's is around. Who's yeah. in the room. <laughs> yes. yeah. Everyone's had a gradual, we've had a gradual getting to know them over many, many years. And, yeah. and, and of course, it's the people who are passionate about sharing it and who have a strong sort of volunteer type attitude that we really yeah. connect to because that's the attitude we have. And, and so they are the ones who eventually spend a lot more time with us, share, you know, doing the back, background work or some of the background work at least uh, that I was doing before. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. I mean, you know the the, the usual media claim that uh, you guys run a sort of cult and there are <laughs> yeah. a number of uh, followers who live on the property with you. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've been here for a couple of hours I've seen a few people. There's not that many people. No, so, none of them live with us. No, yeah, we just yeah. live here. Yeah. So, so what's of the claim that you know? Where are you hiding all these? <laughs> where are you hiding all the rest of them? <laughs> well, there's no rest of them. Um, every, everybody has their own choice to listen or not listen. We feel, yeah. and uh, there's no religious faith, and there's no tenets, and there's no boss, and there's no, you know, there's nobody no telling worship or worship or, or anything um, like that. There's no collective praying or any other thing like that. Yeah, there's no kind of ritual. There's no services or anything like that. And certainly we, I'm someone who really values my privacy. privacy, you know, <laughs> and we really work hard on our relationship, don't we, and mm. and our, rela our personal relationship with God. So personally, I, I would never want to live with a whole group of people at this yeah. point anyway. I can't no, imagine same. ever wanting to. Sounds uh, like my idea of a nightmare. Yeah. No, no. Just, yeah. And certainly we're not addicted to having a lot of people around us yeah, thinking yeah. that in we're fact, ace. because fact, it's probably quite opposite at the moment. We're yeah. quite protective of our private time. We're a little bit, yeah. yeah, hermits. But And also most people who are around us, as those guys would probably attest to, you know, we really practice what we talk about. So there's a lot of truthfulness and there's a lot of... Um, we're open and honest about it. We're open and honest about everything. And so when we do even do public presentations, a lot of people are there, but they feel challenged because we're really honest about... If they ask us a question, we answer really honestly. And so there's not what I would call a lot of... Um, my concept of cults is that like there's someone who's like really looked up to and uh, sort of aspire like a, a put on a pedestal and all this kind of thing and yeah you need a guru yeah I think it's the, the guru yeah. that makes it the cult <laughs> <laughs> and that's not really your experience is it no nah, well that's not my experience for and it's not reasons, it's <laughs> not also what you try and set up in any way no no and also nobody uh, very few people actually agree with what I say anyway. So yeah. a lot of people like to hear it, uh, you think, perhaps. You think your message is a bit too spicy to ever, ever I don't know if uh, it's gain spicy a big following? Or sometimes it's spicy, I suppose, but a lot of times it's also a bit utopian for people. You know, people have a lot of doubts yeah. in their life. and That would never work. So, practice. you know, they don't yeah. think that it's practical. Um, so there's a lot of that as well, where people don't think I'm being very practical. They sort of think to a degree that I live in cloud cuckoo land yeah sure, and sure. yeah that's right isn't it and also um like <laughs> we talk a lot about universal truth like how the universe operates the nature of god what the the science of the human soul is and all of that and then we also talk about the personal work that's involved if you actually want to have a relationship with god and a lot of people are not very they're interested in the first part of that, but in the second part when it comes to really like having self-reflection and looking at your own personal ethics and feeling your own emotions instead of like making other people responsible for them. And a lot not, of people don't like... And not codependent like, addiction, that's a bigger thing, yes, isn't it? Yes, we're always... Um, people, people don't want to be, as, as we talked about privately with you just before, people don't sort of want to know much about their personal things. They, they like to know... They like to hear about the the universe 
as long as it, anything in the universe doesn't affect them personally. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like um, God is loving. There is not a defined hell that you're in eternally, like that there's laws that govern everything and that they're, you can observe them and understand. Like mathematical and scientific. A so. lot of people, and that, yeah, and that there's a spirit world and there's assistance available. and all, Like a lot of those things people are very fascinated by mm. and find really interesting. But when it comes to saying, well, see, right now you're harming this other person because you are expecting them to take all your fear away. Yeah. And and you and if they don't, you get very angry, and that's a big problem for you, not for them. Yeah. Um, people that's, don't necessarily like. That's where people that become well. very self-protective emotionally, and they get angry and resentful and so forth. Yes. Yes. Mm. Yeah. That's a part of it. It's like there's two parts to truth. One part is the external truth. You know how the world, the universe operates. And people are, ver people are quite attracted to that, generally, you know, knowing more about the universe and knowing more about science. And and the meaning of your the life. The meaning of life and while you're mathematics and all these kind of things are all things that most people have some degree of fascination about. But when it comes to actually going, well, your attitude about, you know, life or death eating or meat, eating even. meat or you know, some other thing is actually impacting the world negatively. Hmm that's when people start getting pretty protective about about themselves and yeah the meat thing really pisses people off <laughs> <laughs> well that's probably a minor that's thing that's a minor thing <laughs> that's that's in, compared to <laughs> <laughs> most, most people we find eventually you know we talk a lot about a relationship with god and and yep. so most people most people start to contemplate well maybe that is possible like so so after years of inspiration about the issue and mm. years of truth about it and also, to some degree, there is some recognition that after long discussions with me and, and long amounts of listening, there's a lot of um, very um, self-evident facts that get presented, I suppose, in that yeah. process. Yeah. Yeah, and people will respect that and you people, do practice what you preach, don't they? Yeah, like, and so they get to the point where they go, okay, now you, you're telling me, so, so this is what I tell people, I tell people that the only way I know these things is through my relationship with God. So then they start asking questions like, well, what do you mean by a relationship with God? What, how do you start that? What's going on? And so forth. And then they start asking more personal questions like, well, what inside of me is preventing this relationship with God? And so forth. And that's when things start getting a bit tricky when it comes to truth. Mm -hmm. Because that, at that point, most people go, well, I'm not prepared to do that, or I'm, I don't like what you're saying to me about that, or mm. they, and they also have a tendency to believe you're judging them when that's not the case mm. at all. Yes. You're just stating what the truth is about relationship with God, you know, that there are, you could say, laws involved in the relationship with God, principles that are involved about all about love that, that a person needs to come to understand and live by, and, and many of us are quite resistive to living by them because we've been usually brought up to be quite self-absorbed or selfish or, uh, or, or at least uh, we look at life from a very personal perspective and, and also have a high tendency generally to ignore truth about ourselves. Mm. And, and these kind of things then start getting confronted. So on one hand, you've got the truth about the universe, which most people seem quite attracted to, to initially. And then you've got the truth about yourself, which most people feel quite negative about. Mm. <laughs> and, and this particular problem, which is the desire for truth external, but not for the desire for truth internal, is where people listen for a while. And this is what we generally find with divine truth or God's truth. People listen for a while until they start getting quite confronted personally. Mm. And then they go, no, there's too much confrontation to me personally now. So mm. I've had enough of this now. And they try to find something else that... Uh, generally doesn't confront them as much. Yes. Um, yeah. That's the way it usually turns out. So the people who stick through that self-confronting process are pretty unique. And, yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and we tend to have quite long-term relationships with those people because they're quite unique people and, and, uh, and therefore people who, um, who are like ourselves because we are also confronted by God's truth. Or yes. Yeah. 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 We ourselves have lots of, uh, we've had to deal with lots of emotions and we've, had to go through lots of painful things in order to mm -hmm. come to the point of view of seeing things the way God sees them. And, uh, and so we're quite attracted to people who are prepared to do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, emotional mm. bravery is attractive, I think. Yeah, it is. It is. It is.
Yeah. Like, uh, people find it easier to go to war and do all sorts of horrible things <clears throat> than just face yeah. how they feel. Yeah, that's dead right. Wrong. That is dead right. Yeah. And in fact, most of the problems of the planet are caused by the lack of emotional bravery. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, let's 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 just go there. Let's talk about that. Tell, can you tell me about the process of um, self-identifying as Jesus? And well, yeah, well, that was a pretty hard process, <laughs> and um, a process where I needed to learn emotional bravery, actually. And mm. um, I've had memories in this life ever since I was uh, as long as I can remember. So since I was around about two or so, I've had memories about things that have happened to me. Um, not just bad things either, good things that have happened to me that had no relation to this life. Can you give me an example of a bad thing and a good thing? Well, uh, bad things. I had memories of somebody putting nails through my feet and through my wrists, um, being speared, um, uh, you know, being threatened frequently, uh, being stabbed a few times, um, being beaten on a number of occasions, almost to the point of death. Um, and you know, quite a lot of these kind of events uh, that all had nothing to do with my life because none of those things I knew had happened in this life. Good things, uh, things like um, being with a woman, uh, even when I had never even been with a woman, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, being with Mary specifically, um, having a life of uh, teaching, teaching, even though when I was little I'd, I'd not understand it. But I loved, uh, I even loved teaching when I was little because I had these memories of teaching and uh, and and sharing truth. Also visiting uh, new places of existence, um, which I now know to be different dimensional places of existence. But back then I didn't understand any of that. And most of these, uh, what you classify as memories, were, uh, were all emotional, firstly. And secondly, they were all very unusual. <laughs> mm. There's no other way I could term them. And so what I did was I compartmentalized them. Mm. So I sort of um, separated myself from them uh, completely. By the time I was about 12 or 13 in this life, I'd pretty much completely separated myself from them. And, and at this point, when you were 12 or 13, you were living in Loxton, in South Australia. Um, no, we just moved from Loxton to another place in South Australia called Clare, which is in the mid-north of South Australia. But yeah, by that stage, I'd, I'd made a pretty firm decision to, to not remember, mm. actually. And, um, and then in my, 30, in my late 20s, it got harder and harder to deny uh, the memories. Um, I still didn't talk about them with anybody. Was there a particular memory that kept coming back for you late at night? Well, the hardest one was the ones of being the hard ones, you know, like being tortured and stuff. <clears> like that. And, yeah. and these kind of memories um, were always a bit distressing, uh, as you can imagine. And you didn't associate and them with I any didn't... particular uh, uh, identity or person, no. did you? You thought that that was it was just something somehow, that happened to me. Does something that, that make sense? happened to you. I didn't sort of associate it with being Jesus or anything. Did you ever see a psychologist or? Sure, certainly, I've seen many. Yeah, yeah certainly. And most of them would say, yeah, you've got to, these are feelings you've got. You've obviously been abused as a child. And I, you know, no, I haven't been abused as a child. And I say, no, that you've got the feelings of being abused as a child. Let's take you through child abuse and see where that goes, you know, and things like that. And I've been through a lot of that. <laughs> um, and come out always feeling a bit better. Um, but, they, but I'm describing events that had no relation to my life. Um, and, you know, then, then, of course, new age people say, oh, isn't that just past lives? And I go, no, I don't believe in past lives. That's a, you know, I, I've never have believed in past lives <laughs> my entire life. Mm. I still don't believe in past lives, to be honest, because um, I've never observed one from the spirit world or from Earth. But, um, and there's an explanation for all of those things. So, so I never thought of that either because, of, because it's quite obvious to me as a part of my memories that that doesn't happen. And then... Um, there were also, uh, well, there, was, there were so many occurrences where no, they're saying to me, no, you've got the emotions in you. So that means these things have to have happened. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, well, they haven't happened. <laughs> you know, like, fair enough, let's go through the emotions. So that's when I learned to have some emotional bravery mm -hmm. about going through emotions that I had no understanding of. And, and as I started doing that, my life got better, uh, which was great. So I start, my life started to get better. 
I started to uh, be able to cope with life better and so forth. You were working as a computer technician at the time? Yeah, I was working as a computer consultant. I'm a system, I'm an electronics engineer and mm -hmm. uh, worked as a systems engineer and, and analyst. And um, and I had my own company as well that, um, that eventually I sold. But um, all dur during this time, I was also sort of trying to deal with all this other stuff going on, sort of like... I still had a very strong feeling of like, keep that as far away <laughs> from me as possible uh, because it all is too hard um, to address emotionally and uh, just, you know, keep going with life. And and I think a lot of people on the planet probably relate to that just with their own emotions even. Mm. And, and then uh, I started going, uh, started having more and more of these memories, <laughs> unfortunately, the more... The, the better I got emotionally, the more of these memories I started having. Mm. And that happened over a period of uh, eight years. Yes. Um, and then until, I, until it reached a point uh, when I was 40, where, so this started when I was 32, when the, you know, I couldn't keep the memories at bay. And so I went through all this process emotionally. And by the time I was 40, I was feeling like, yeah, I've pretty much dealt with everything. That all was pretty unusual. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> I don't know what that was all about, uh, but uh, I now accept that I have these memories and I still don't know why. Um, and I still didn't believe in past life or anything like that. Uh, mm -hmm. And as I say, I still don't. So, um, but, but I just accepted the emotions of them and that made my life better. But as soon as I got to that point, I started having emotions about who I was. <laughs> mm. So that, that, that was another <laughs> very difficult traumatic period okay wait so you yeah. say no, there were separate issues so you thought you had a, pre a previous life but you weren't you weren't sure who that was and then you put a name no on. he didn't think i don't believe in previous life. lives <laughs> yeah he okay. thought they so must... i didn't have an explanation for all of my memories or my emotions i just felt that i had to feel them because that was getting me feeling better sure so yeah. i decided that the best way to get better was just just accept that i've got these emotions even though I was thoroughly confused about where they come from and accept that I have these memories, even though I'm thoroughly confused about where they came from too. And, and just, and as I let myself feel that I had these memories and emotions, eventually I got to the point where I was feeling better. So that, that, uh, that felt great to me. And, and in fact, my business took off and I finished up setting up three more businesses and a couple of uh, another a, a property development business and a few other things and all of which were fairly successful and uh, and I was quite content with that uh, decision does mm. that make sense mm. but then I started having uh, some memories over the course of the of a period of the next five years um, that told me who I was and that that I wasn't very happy about to be frank <laughs> sure do you um, remember do you remember the moment when you were well I, there was no sort of one moment but there was a period of about two or three weeks in particular that were particularly intense because uh, i had these realizations that i was jesus where were you at the time i was at my home on my at my home by myself and your home at this point was where it was at, at Goolwa in south australia on a bit on the beach yeah it's nice. a nice place and yeah i think i used to go body surfing every morning yeah. and yeah um do my work and go body surfing every evening and yeah, yeah it was lovely and uh, and that's where I was, and um, and I had to ring up all my clients and just cancel the next three weeks uh, or four weeks. I finished up cancelling four week period of everything, and uh, because of, I couldn't even sort of function properly aside from cooking for myself and cleaning up after myself, um, because it was just too like I'm um, sort of like going oh crap like. How bad is this? <laughs> is really yeah. what it felt like, um, and <clears throat> it was like I was so I was very distressed about it um, emotionally. Why? Why distressed? Because it felt like it. I also knew what that meant, and and one of the things I felt that it meant was that I'd have to say to people that I am, and that was something that I just did not want to do at all. Um, I also felt that it meant that I might, because I still had some emotions about getting attacked uh, through the torture events that have happened in my life. Sure. Um, I felt that that would probably mean that I'd get attacked a lot and people would, you know, try to certify me and put me away. And uh, I just had, I had a lot of 
big problems with it, to be frank, that I then over the, so the, that four week period was a very intense period uh, emotionally where I did a lot of crying basically about the whole issue. It was really a great big tantrum I was having. Were, you, were your family there? No. Living with your family? No. No, I was living alone uh, at this stage. And uh, my boys were living in another one of the houses that I They were, that I owned. They were old by then. <clears throat> yeah, my <throat> sons were from a, from a previous marriage were living um, in, in Adelaide. And How old were they? They were, by this stage, they were uh, 19 and 20. Did you share any of what you were going through with them? Only after about six months or so. Um, it took me the first six months to even get to the point where I was willing to even talk about it to anybody, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, and even then, I was very circumspect about talking about it. Mm. Um, but I, they were the first persons I told, my two sons. Um, Let's just uh, just rewind for one moment. So I'm imagining you in this house, and you know you're going body surfing, surfing in the evenings, and it's you know it's quite nice. Yeah. But uh, you just realised that you have this incredible burden on your shoulders. Uh, what what was the part of it? I mean, aside from telling people, you know, did you feel this responsibility? What was the part that really you just kept going back to? Well, the other thing that happened during that period was that I started remembering everything. Um, that I'd experienced in 2000 years, but in a very rapid way. So what happened was I, um, I started writing in books, um, all the things I could remember. And, and, and I also remembered how we got here again, like even all that process, I remembered what happened and what decisions were made and, and all of those kind of things. And, and, and it, it, like it was a very sort of surreal period, I suppose you could say in some ways, because it's like here I am a computer consultant doing my engineer work on one hand, and then on the other hand, all this other stuff's going on that I'm remembering how the universe works and how it all fits together, and and you know at that, before then I didn't um, really remember well my relationship with God either, <clears throat> ironically. So I started remembering that and how. And remembering Mary, in fact, it's part of the trigger of it all, that uh, before then I didn't re really remember her. I always felt there was one person for me in the world, but I never really had a clear idea about that other than the idea that there was one person for me in the mm. world type of thing. And, uh, and I remember who she was and what, you know, what she looked like and, all, all, you know, when all through that life and things like that. And, and so the memories just kept on piling up. It's like, it's sort of like if you can imagine just a flood of memories yeah. all happening very, very rapidly. Over what kind of period would you say? Well, that, that was a very intense period for me where I just had floods of memories about all the laws that God has and how they all operate and interoperate together and how the environment is affected and then how the universe is affected and how there's layers of uh, dimensions and how the dimensional spaces exist and how mathematics has proven dimensional spaces existence and you know what scientists call dark matter and dark energy and what all that is and 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 just it just kept going and going and going and going in on pretty much any subject you could choose so mm. if you chose emotion i know well, that as well like how that all works and yeah. how god measures it and how how it's measured scientifically and mathematically through god's laws and all these kind of things and 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 it just kept going on and on and on and on and until it got to the point where I got so overwhelmed by the whole thing, I decided I've just got to shut this down <laughs> again, try to shut it down at least, and just deal with what I now have come to know. Uh, does that make sense? It's sort of like yeah. a flood of memories that I hadn't been able to yet cope with emotionally, like ca catch up with emotionally. Mm. So then the next uh, few months, I decided to close down my businesses. So, so I did all that. Uh, and I just instantly closed down all my businesses. Because you sort of had some feelings in you about our purpose. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so I remembered why we were here again and all yeah. that as well as a part of the process. So it sounds rattling. It, it was terrible. <laughs> it, it, like, it, like when I look back on it, I think it's good now, when, now that it happened. But... But at the time, I thought it was the most terrible and horrible thing that could have happened to me. Did you ever wonder if you were having some sort of nervous breakdown or developing schizophrenia or something? Well, because I'd been through the process of dealing with emotion before with regard to torture-based abuse and things like that, 
I knew how to deal with my emotions. So that didn't bother me anymore. Um, I could cope with emotion. I didn't need uh, medication or anything like that to cope with emotion. And I, I could still function in my life, obviously. I could still yeah. care for myself. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I guess, like, for example, the other day, I found a freckle that was, like, a little larger than it used to be, and I'm like, no, that's it. Skin cancer, I'm done. <laughs> so I'm imagining if I was in your situation, I'd have gone, oh, what's happening in my brain? What, you know, what's the neurological basis? For well, I come up with some logic about it that helped me through a lot of it. And that was, there were four points of logic that I felt. One was... I'm either Jesus and I am, or I think I'm Jesus, but I'm not. Which right? would be crazy. Which would make me crazy, basically. Or I think I'm Alan John Miller and I am, which would make me sane. Mm -hmm. Or I think I'm Alan John Miller and I'm not, which would make me crazy. So what I had to do then from those four positions... Those odds aren't good. <laughs> no, <laughs> two of them are go going to end up in crazy. What, what, right? if, what, if, uh, what if you thought you were Jesus, but you weren't crazy? As in, as, as in, what if you thought you were Jesus, but you weren't Jesus, but that didn't necessarily mean you were crazy? Well, you have well, to be crazy if you think you're someone that you're not, don't you? Exactly. I think a lot of people all the time think they're someone they're not. Well, well I... You could argue that they're crazy. You well, could I also would, argue I'm, that they're not, and it's just very human to do that. Well, I don't think it is human to do that. I think it's unreasonable to do that, and I certainly wouldn't be able to do that myself. Okay. Um, so while they 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 are able to think whatever they think about themselves, and I'm not judging them for their for their thoughts, mm. but I am saying that if you do think you're someone that you actually turn out not to be, mm. that's not a very good state for you personally. Mm. And uh, and I knew that, and I I knew that for me that wouldn't be. I had to resolve the issue. Is mm. the feeling I had. Mm. I had to do whatever was necessary to get to the point of resolving the issue. So that meant allowing these memories to be there and contemplating their meaning, basically. It's a bit like you allowing, let's say you'd had a car accident mm. and you've lost your memory. Mm. And so you, you woke up and you didn't really know who you were. And then some, you know, someone helps you through a process emotionally to find out what the cause is that blocked you from receiving your past memories. Mm. And if it wasn't some kind of brain damage, but rather some kind of emotional process that blocked you, somebody encouraging you to go down that place, no matter what the results might you might find out. Mm. And that's basically what I decided to do. Mm. I decided to go down the process of finding out what these memories told me um, without um, too much judgment and um, and allowing myself to feel about them and, and contemplate these memories as being actual real based on my life rather than um, some other source. Now, the very first thing I tried to do is try to blame it on some other source, <laughs> of course. which it actually would do. Yeah. So, so, so I tried to blame it on maybe there's some kind of strange, like I didn't believe in uh, an afterlife at that stage of my life or anything. Yep. I didn't believe there were spirits. I didn't believe there were people talking who could talk to you who were dead or any of these kind of things. But I, I started thinking, well, what if it's that? So then I went down that track to try and uh, investigate that as well, whether it was that or not. And then what I found was when I did allow people to talk to me who I could hear from, um, from people that I couldn't see, uh, they weren't telling me the things that I was telling me. <laughs> so <laughs> they were telling me other things. So... You know, the, so then I realised that, ah, oh, okay, so I could, I now recognised and remembered, of course, as a part of the memory process that people between the spirit world, if you want to call it that, and the earth or other dimensions on earth can communicate with each other. And, uh, and I remembered doing that in my past, like communicating with other people on earth all through my life in the 2000 years. And so I knew that that was a fact of life based on my own experience, but um, then I had to contemplate, well, maybe they're just talking to me and telling me about this, you know. Mm -hmm. so, so then I went through that process of working out that. But that so that now process now took another five years. Mm, oh, time-consuming process. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, so that... And you weren't really, really super open mm. with the public about, about <clears throat> this in those five years. Where you, Not That's at the all. time period where you were <clears throat> um, no relationship, lived on your own largely didn't you yeah occasionally you started near the end of that um talking with small groups of people didn't you 
Yeah, so uh, probably about after after the six month period where I sort of started to will get to comfortable to the point that I would still continue investigating this. Mm. rather than just trying to deny it because every time I tried to deny it, my situation ended up worse. So, mm. so I decided to just go ahead and uh, and let myself remember the things that I remembered and so yeah. forth and uh, let myself uh, feel about those things and see whether those things were true. So I experimented with every one of the things that I remembered to see whether it was true and sure enough, uh, all of these things were true based on the experiments anyway. And so, so what I would do is I'd just continue with the process and be sort of quite accepting of it emotionally. But, but it was another, um, probably another year before anybody even heard of me having uh, going through this stuff, aside from my children. Do you remember that phone call with, with your children? It wasn't a phone call. I did a face-to-face with them, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I How did that go? Um, well... Um, my youngest son at the time said, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> really? That yeah. Quickly? Yeah. How uh, did you phrase it? Uh, well, I, well, uh, I don't know why he said that because he now doesn't believe it. But <laughs> anyway, what did, my older son what thought you? maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. You uh, have to prove it, dad. You have to, don't you have to prove it, dad? And I said, well, no, I don't feel I have to prove it. I just, the proof for me is my memories. Like, yeah, it's just yeah. like your proof of who you are is yeah. your memories. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Tristan uh, was here earlier. Really. You missed it. Did you meet him? No, you met him. Yeah, you met Tristan. Briefly, yeah. yeah. But Tristan um, had started going through his own processes, and after nearly 10 years of doing that, he he probably has more acceptance of it now. Uh, and, in fact, he probably does feel that I am Jesus. But I, I really want to explore this moment where, so, so we're talking about self-belief and I think it's really interesting mm-hmm. at that point where you go, okay, I'm going to tell someone, I'm going to tell someone about what I've been feeling and who I've come mm-hmm. to believe I am. So it was the first person. Well, to be honest, I wasn't that definite about it <laughs> sure. at this stage. I was just like, this is what I'm flirting with guys. <laughs> just going to put it on the table. <laughs> just going to put it on the table because but it's pretty out there and I don't know why it's all happening and, but. But when they start asking me questions about what I remember, then I, it all just sort of flows out pretty easy then. Sure. Um, but um, when it comes to why I remember it, you know, I still didn't really have... I, I, I know why in the terms of the science of it all, mm-hmm. but I didn't have any reasons as to why now, or not 20 years ago or something like that, you know. But these are memories that I had, like I said, all my life. So it's just that I've compartmentalised them mm. and pushed them away. You didn't really go through this process, did you, where you went, I don't don't have any idea mm. about being someone else. Now I do, and it's definite. You yeah, went through, no. it would, I think that would be problematic, and certainly not my experience either. Well, I, I know that you, to be spirit-based influence yes. now. And I, and I can see that in people, you know, when people will take some drugs or whatever, and then all of a sudden they become another person. Mm. Sometimes that's psychomatic. And sometimes that is influenced by people who have passed mm. influencing the person. And I can see when people do that now. Mm. So so I can see the spirit influencing the person. I know the name of the spirit influencing the person. And I know their life and what they were doing. So at the end of the day, um, you know, I can see when a person has these instant changes that that what the cause of their instant change. Right. What about yeah. the, what about if you talked about maybe I I've never actually directly asked you about it. But, um, you know, the first secrets of the universe you did where it's a fir- it's on camera. You're saying right up front, this is who I am to gr- like about 200 people. Would you that 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 was a pretty uh, um, was that a big moment? Not really. Well, not really because it, by because then by you- then see see people eventually asked me to talk at their homes, so I talk at their homes, and they knew privately that I was saying I was Jesus at this stage. Um, we'll come back to, I'm really curious at that point. About because, the belief. Yeah. yeah, because it feels to me like even if there was a very gradual process of, of coming to understand yourself as, as a particular person, then at some point you must have told someone and have had a lot of trepidation about it. Certainly. I'd love to hear you describe that. I, I'm still not 100% comfortable with it, to be honest, mm. like, because it, it still sometimes feels a bit strange to me in the sense that um i'm well not so much strange to me but i know it's strange for them to hear what i'm saying Mm. so it's sort of like you know this sounds way out there so 
you know, I understand if you don't sort of get it type of thing. But And it's, it, it's kind of like... My main fears were about getting hurt, to be honest. So hurt by... Rejected and... Rejected. <clears throat> no, no, I mean violently attacked and um, put in an asylum and never see the light of day again. Those kind of fears. Has anything like that ever happened? No. A lot of people have... My mum tried to make it happen, actually, but... Really? Yeah, but but it didn't happen, so... I had a very reasonable talk with the doctors and they could see that I was obviously clear thinking <laughs> and that was about it. But I was forced to go to doctors and site to, to, be, assessed. to be assessed. What was by, their professional assessment? Um, they didn't know what to think. And in fact, what finished up happening was that they all started to get quite angry with me. Um, but they probably didn't share the diagnosis with you, did they? No. No. They all got angry with me and obviously decided to drop the issue because I was talking to them about, okay, why is it that you think I'm crazy? Um, are you an atheist or are you a Christian or whatever is your belief? And they'd tell me. And I'd say, well, a lot of times they're atheists. And I said, so you're an atheist, but you're a doctor. And obviously you have Christians come along who sincerely believe in Jesus. Mm. Um, do you treat them like they're crazy? Mm. Or do you just accept that as a belief? What, which, what do you do with them? Mm. And, and I'm saying, well, if you do that with them, why aren't you just accepting this is my belief? Yeah. Well, why can't you accept that? I'm, I'm otherwise healthy. I don't want to commit suicide. I'm not trying to harm anybody. In fact, if anything, I'm trying to help people. Um, I'm trying to help the environment. I try, to, I try to live a good life. Why is it that you now want to commit me when I'm fully functional? Mm. I've got, yeah, I still have the companies of, uh, running at this stage. Um, I'm self-sufficient. Um, but... but you're not willing to commit a Christian who says he believes in Jesus. So why is that? Like, what, what's going on there? And, 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 of course, they couldn't answer that kind of logic, so mm. they let me go. Hmm. <laughs> Do you remember at which point you, you felt comfortable enough with it to, to not try to... Like, it was who you are. Do you remember that transition from maybe to, yeah, pretty, pretty comfortable? Um, well, that was probably just before the time I met Mary, really. Um, I'd spent five years, another five years on my own, uh, doing, you know, working through the issues emotionally, the memories that I had. Yeah, and um, um, so, so I was going through this process, I suppose you could say, of um, emotional resolution of the issue. And um, I had, a, during this phase, a lot of longing, I suppose you'd call it, for Mary, and a lot of grief about missing her. So I went through a long period of time where I spent a lot of time, um, like, grieving losing my Mary. And um, in that process, my desire for Mary grew and grew and grew. And then I sort of started feeling like, oh, I'm going to meet her soon. Um, and, and I also started knowing where she was. She was somewhere up in Queensland. And at this stage, I was still, I just, I was in between South Australia and Queensland, but living in South Australia. I've heard this area described as a Bible belt. Was it that that drew you to this area? Not at all. No. Um, in you fact, I didn't know that. Did you? No, I didn't know that at all. But, um, but any area that's a Bible belt, in my experience, is very opposing of uh, me saying I'm Jesus. So, and naturally, you could understand that I wouldn't have chosen to live in a Bible Belt area for that reason. Yes. <laughs> but um, particularly bearing in mind the fears I had of getting harmed again. But, but, uh, but I had a strong feeling Mary lived here. That, that was all. You looked at the map it. one day and you were like, there. Yeah. 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 What do you want to say? I'm curious. Yeah. What, what do you think? Uh, no, I was just remembering, you know, Tristan's told me about how you, like, you, like you said, you dealt with a lot of emotion, let go of a lot of emotion and felt this real longing for me. And you would literally try and feel me, feel me I would out. spend like, days just um, laying there feeling where Mary is. <laughs> and, yeah, and, uh, and he got pretty close to the mark um, because he ended up in my parents' living room. Um, but also I grew up um, like 45 minutes from here, hmm. from right here. That's amazing. Yeah. Mm. And, but I wasn't living here at that time. Mm. 
obviously, as I said earlier, yeah. And you were there until you, what, age 12 or something? 12, yeah. yeah. So it was all Mary's early life that she was actually... But then my parents live now just a couple of hours that way, yeah. yeah. Did you ever have any false alarms? You know, you're out driving and when you eat? Yeah. Did you ever have any moments like that? False alarms of false alarms where you thought you you thought yeah you thought you saw Mary. Mary and then it turned out it wasn't. No, I had a lot of people tell me, oh, I reckon this is Mary, and I and because I was always keen on finding out where Mary was, I would go and see. Yeah, of course. Um, but you had a couple of ones like that, didn't you? Where once you felt um, when you were still right back at the beginning, you had an unresolved relationship with another woman, yeah, and you kind of projected onto her that that was probably me and it didn't well i was hopeful that it was because yeah. <laughs> you really wanted to be with her um and then one other one where someone else told you and, and you... got quite forceful with me yeah and about yeah. my not accepting yeah. the truth about it type of thing wait she was forceful with you no the woman wasn't but the person the guy who told me about her said i know it's her and you know and saying you just don't want to accept that it. it was one of my friends at the time um and it would have been i say at the time he's still my friend but mm. um but it, i went and investigated and sure enough i felt that wasn't the case so not mary yeah not mary so um i knew when i met mary that i'd know when i met mary type of thing and uh, you did. and i did as soon as i saw mary in the living room <laughs> yeah of the parents place i have one more question before we move on to, to your part of the story mary. Yeah, yeah uh and that is did did this period of self-reflection and, and you know, changing your self-identity a bit, did did it affect your your circle? I mean, your friends, your family. Did you change Great. friends? Oh, I lost all my friends. You lost all of them? Yeah, everyone. You didn't oh. have a good best friend who sort of stuck around? No. And no, not a single Did person. that happen quickly or what was that process? Yeah, very quickly. Um, when I say very quickly, the more I accepted my memories, the less everyone around me accepted me. As in the more you were happy to talk about it, you go to the pub and, you know, your best mate would be there. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, I'm Jesus. Yeah, anybody, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you can imagine you know, sure. what the response would be. And, of course, no one wants to know how that occurred. So, you know, not, not, I think this is probably the first time I've ever mentioned to anybody how it actually happened. But um nobody really wants to know that because they all have a judgment right at the beginning you know yes. like oh, it can't be true so you know this guy must be just a bit nuts or or it might be true uh, well no it can't be true but let's say he's he's just influenced by something whatever that is drugs or whatever did you ever have anyone say to you you know you need to stop taking drugs or like <laughs> um i've had people say pretty much everything you probably could imagine and mm. um, i don't take drugs and never have in my whole life so mm. um and uh, I don't drink either, so mm. <laughs> um, it's certainly not alcohol or drugs that's caused these conclusions. Mm. Um, and and as anybody would explain to you, I'm a very logical person in my day-to-day -day life. So Yeah, I mean, computers are <clears throat> yeah, as um, logical as it gets. Yeah, and programmer and yeah. whatever else, and everything I do even now is still pretty logical um, for what my goals are. And so, you know, most people that met me after a while accept that while they don't understand why I'm saying I'm Jesus, they do accept that I'm not crazy in the normal sense of the word psychologically. Do any of your friends ever offer sympathy or no, or help? No. Most no. people, well, I can't speak for you, but most people become very challenged. And it was a very alone time of my life. Yeah. Because it, the people I thought were my friends, turned out not to be. Yeah. yeah, and my experience was as well. Like there was times, like I mentioned to you briefly outside, about after we first met, and I went through a whole lot of stuff about, you know, it was challenging my family, and I and I know you're going to ask me about this separately, but I just mean in reference to friends. Um, you know, there was times where I was really needy for, for my friends and I had, like, girlfriends that I'd had for, like, 10 years, 20 years, nearly 30 years, and not a one could talk to me about it, you know. that, that And I don't know They if, tried and failed or there was a reluctance to even they, try? They wouldn't bring it up. I would try to talk about Mary it. Mary would try to raise it, but they yeah. wouldn't even let you go there. It's, it's like a real fear of, like, and it was the same for me. On for I, you, I, like, if I tried to raise it, Nobody around me would let me go there. 
do you guys think that you had lousy friends or is that just no. indicative of everyone? No, I feel that it's pretty hard thing to accept. Yeah. It is a pretty hard, like my feelings for my friends at the time were, no, it was all pretty hard to accept. I understand that. Like it's not probably what I would have done because I've always been a pretty open person in the sense of, Same, yeah. and not very judgmental. So, but, um, but I understand why they chose to do what they're doing. And most of them are still confused, uh, to be honest, because most of them I know still quite like our personalities, mm. um, but don't know how to relate to this whole Jesus and Mary thing. Yeah, so, that would be my um, experience too. Was it possible that you were, you know, pushing up in their face a bit too much? No, I never pushed anything in their face. No, in fact, mm. if anything, I think I was so scared to talk about it. Mm. Both of us have been frightened to talk that about it. That I possibly the reason they didn't talk to me about it is because they could sense I was just, just freaking out and terrified about mm. it for myself. Okay. And maybe that made them think, if I talk to Mary about this, she's just going to flip out more. You know, I don't want to make her feel worse. Mm. Um, mm. But... I know if the roles were reversed, I would have been like on the phone going, look, how are you going with this thing? I wouldn't have been on the phone. I would have been like in your living room. I would have just been a a friend. But, you know, I'm trying to imagine how I would respond. It's hard to know until you're in the situation, isn't it, with anything really? I mean, I had a friend when I was in it, when I was like 13, 14 or something, who developed a brain tumor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I regret how I behaved at that time because I wasn't very supportive. I think... Uh, I, I kind of found it a bit scary and his his proximity to m- mortality made me a bit nervous and I kind of backed away a bit. And I look yeah. back at that now and think, geez, that was ridiculous. I was stupid and I'm a bit embarrassed about my behaviour. But a person's but, individual fear does guide their action a lot. Like, Yeah. And but, but that was a normal. That was a health issue. And I don't know. I feel like if you're just, if you're the same person, you're just as healthy as you always were. You know, you just develop a new interest or something. Like, I'm not sure but how you'd intellectualize I th- that. I think it's interesting you brought up that example, though, because it, it was like a kind of death for my friends. Mm. I wasn't going to be, um, um, maybe that's overstating it, but I certainly, for the first time, really embraced and was public about what I've been really passionate about always, but I was very interested in doing it within society's kind of accepted norms. And so is like Mary, the chick who, you know, goes out, has cocktails with us, dance on tables. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, like that's the kind good of... old Mary. Yeah, good old Mary. I was good old Mary, yeah. you know, who's who she's up for anything. And... And she, she's real, you know, friendly and not really confrontational at all, you know, and certainly doesn't talk about God. And, and now she's in this drama with her family and actually, like, what does that mean for our family? Like... I had one friend who was really interested. She got the DVDs and stuff, and she was like, "Man, this is she awesome. came along to seminars." Even she came for a while. to to a couple of seminars, and then she was just like, "You know what?" Well, I, no, the, her family put pressure on her. Her in laws put a load of pressure on her to just like stay away from that, you know, stay away, and and she she just sort of went. She never would talk to me about it, but really reading between the lines, you know, I just stopped. I, I was her daughter's god godmum and I didn't I didn't get invited to to the you know, the first birthday. I, it was just like a yeah, where I, I stopped being called, you know, all that kind of just it like just, this phone stops ringing. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. and unfortunately some of the people have had a lot of pressure put on them by other people. Yeah. You know, like some of the yeah. people might have still still be talking to us if yeah. it wasn't for the pressure that other people put on them. Yeah. yeah. Who, who knows? You know? yeah. And I think when you're emotionally invested in a person being a certain way in your life, like yeah. it is confronting when they change. And Excuse so me. you have to be personally willing to let go of that and just want to know them as a person, as a changing person. Most people don't change much once they become an adult. They're like, yes. oh, that's Julian. He's like this. Yeah, you know, yeah. This is kind of how he behaves or yeah. or what he believes or, you know, what he's interested in. And mm. um, yes. not many people go through much And we're constantly change. changing. Yeah. Every year we're different. So yeah. it's sort of hard for friends to, in a lot of ways, keep, keep up with the new person. And, mm. and in a lot of ways um, it feels a bit like the death of who I was in this life in a yeah. lot of ways. It's sort of, it feels like the death of Alan John Miller is what I've had to come to accept. You've got a, you've got a VC and an AD. Yeah, and it, and it 
and the it, well, when you say BC and AD, it's it's more like nearly two thousand years of Jesus and 53, 54 yeah, years now of mm-hmm. AJ or yeah, yeah. Alan John Miller. And so in pre- percentage of my, what occupies my mind, mm-hmm. Alan John Miller occupies around about that percentage, which is what about 0.05 or less percent of, yeah. of, the, of the total of my life. And, and so it feels to me like people find that quite hard as well. Like, you know, when they relate to me, they're trying to relate to Alan John Miller because that's how they see me. But, um, but that's not how I relate to them. I relate to them with, as to who I am and what I remember and everything. And that can be quite uh, a different sort of relationship then. Yeah, it's I can to, imagine. Hard to address, I think, aren't for most people. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Except for people who've met us since then. Obviously, they find it easier. But even mm. then, they find it a bit strange often, don't they? Yeah, well, they, do, they don't often understand my choices or decisions because they can only see the physicality of the decision. They don't sort of see this, all the things that I can see about the decision I'm making. So... So I'm, I'm, I'm assessing things, I'm assessing what's going on in the spirit world as well as what's going on here on earth and assessing, you know, what's happening in the environment and assessing the soul condition based on what I see around me. And by that, I mean the, pe- the person's emotional condition, every person's feelings. So they might present to me what they believe themselves to be, but I'm relating to who I can feel they are. Um, and that is sometimes hard for people as well. So... So I can understand the uh, the difficulties people are facing the more we progress because mm. we're not fully progressed yet. Um, I'm still having memories every day <laughs> and uh, Mary is too. So um, we're, not, we're not fully ourselves yet. And as we progress, um, people find it hard to sort of keep up with the progress, I suppose. Mm. Yeah.